Um, so my name is Michelle Dover. I am the Director of Programs at Plowshares Fund, and I have the pleasure of introducing our final speaker of the day, Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Before assuming the office in 2009, he was a five-term member of the Oregon House of Representatives, representing House District 47 in eastern Multnomah County in, Portland, in the Portland city limits. He served as Speaker of the Oregon House of Representatives from 2007 to 2009. He's been a supporter of the Iran Agreement, a co-sponsor of bills such as the SANE Act to cut the modernization programs, and he is a strong advocate for the issues that Plowshares works on every day. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Senator Jeff Merkley. Well, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and, and for the invitation. And I particularly want to thank Beatrice and her team for laying out a vision and advocacy for the world without nuclear weapons. As I was catching the, the last of her remarks, I was thinking about how John F. Kennedy, and I don't have this exactly right, but he referred to nuclear weapons as a sort of Damocles hanging over us by the thinnest of threads, and we must abolish them before they abolish us. Thank you, Beatrice, and thank you, ICANN. Work well done. In 1992, I was just out of graduate school, and, um, excuse me, 19, um, yeah, 92, 82, 1982, <laughs> I was just out of graduate school, my life took a dramatic turn. I was at the uh, World Bank, and I was planning to save up mon enough money to go overseas and volunteer with groups like, like Mercy Corps and Catholic Relief Services and so forth, spend my life working on third world economic development. I thought that what worthier use of your life could there be than than fighting to address these issues of poverty. I'd been an exchange student uh, in uh, a village in Ghana through AFS when I was 16 years old. It was a very profound experience and it really had shaped my vision of, of what I would do with these short few years that I, I get to have on, on planet Earth. But as I was there at the World Bank, something unexpected happened. I was called in as a finalist to be a presidential fellow uh, with um, the defense secretary and Wow, that's a whole different world. And I thought, well, that interview under the Reagan administration, that's, that's going to be a, an interesting experience. Uh, and it was. They arranged the senior members of the Defense Department in, in a curve. There were about eight of them. Uh, they um, put a light on the chair that, where I was sitting. And it, was, it felt like a criminal interrogation. And the first question I was asked was, well, we see on your resume that you interned for Senator Hatfield, and he votes against all the defense appropriations. And we see you spent two summers working with the Quakers in Mexican villages, and they have the peace testimony. Why would we ever hire you at the Secretary of Defense's office? And I thought, exactly. <laughs> Why would you ever hire me? And I, but I conveyed to them that national security is so much more than just military affairs. It's, economic development, it's uh, cultural understanding, it's dialogue. I laid out the vision of how nations work together. And so uh, to my, my surprise, they did, did hire me. And I wrestled with that change of course. I mean, how much further 180 degrees can you go from working in villages in, in Africa uh, to working on strategic nuclear policy? But I felt at that moment that the biggest threat to the planet was the use of nuclear weapons. The highly tense situation, Russia, then USSR, and the United States armed to the teeth, able to blow up the world many times over hair triggers. And so I felt a moral obligation to step in. It's as if a door had been opened and I had to respond. And so I worked on uh, strategic nuclear weapon policy uh, for the Department of Defense for two years and, and then fellowship ended and I went to work for, for Congress on those issues. So it's kind of a, a chapter long in, long in my past. But that year, that year of 1982, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists moved the doomsday clock to four minutes to midnight. Anybody here with the Bolton by any chance? No. Uh, thought I saw an arm for a second. Uh, but 
I think you're all very aware of their work to evaluate in a very simple to understand way how close we are to a nuclear disaster. And in recent years, they've added in how close we are to disaster through climate change, uh, something else that I've become deeply immersed in because that is now such a threat to the planet. But they reset in 1982 to four minutes. The Soviets had invaded Afghanistan the previous year. President Reagan was in office. He had scrapped any talk of arms control. And then by two years later, the situation was worse. The bulletin reset the clock to three minutes to midnight. U.S.-Soviet relations were in the deep freeze. Communications were virtually shut down. Star Wars was underway. The U.S. was seeking to create a space-based anti-ballistic missile capability. Huge concerns about a new arms race. And as I was there in the Defense Department, I watched uh, career policy people start out just absolutely being dismissive of the whole Star Wars impetus, and then seeing that the whole kind of push of the administration, remember Ed Teller and so forth, the whole push of the administration, they started to see that the whole push of industry then backed that up. There was so much money to be made and working on all these different uh, weapon concepts, and the kind of just the the bureaucracy followed that into that vision. And then it was, of course, time for me to escape and go to work for Congress <laughs> and be in a saner uh, and place where... I do recall one event, though. While I was um, in a meeting with the uh, key group of um, arms control folks, uh, someone came into the room and said, hey, I'm, I'm here from President Reagan's re-election team. And, um, we want to see if anybody has any really good ideas how President Reagan might reach out and bring more people in than he has currently behind him. Room, absolutely silent. And I said, well, I'll tell you, uh, I think it'd be well received if he reached out and took on the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. <laughs> and you should have seen that room then. Like everyone turned and looked at me like I was some kind of mole in the building, <laughs> which maybe was not too far off. Uh, but um, during those years that I was involved, and by 1991, uh, I, I left back for Oregon, but things changed in those years. You had, in 1988, the U.S. and the Soviet Union signed the INF Treaty, banning a whole class of nuclear weapons. 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. In 1990, the USSR collapsed. 1991, the Cold War was declared over. The U.S. and Russia signed the START I Treaty, and the two nations started to do really serious reductions in, in their inventories. And so the doomsday clock was reset to 17 minutes. 17 minutes to doomsday is much better than three minutes to doomsday. And I thought, great, I am out of here. I'm back to Oregon. And I, I went to Oregon, and um, I just uh, had a whole different life out, out there. Uh, and I went to work on uh, economic development in the poorest community in Portland, a, a Portland that was ravaged by gang activity uh, and drug sales. Uh, I fought to work for low-income housing, started a home ownership program, developed affordable housing, started the first uh, development account IDA program, West of Mississippi. Uh, really kind of more back to my, my uh, roots in, in terms of uh, uh, addressing issues of poverty and a foundation for families to thrive. And as I was advocating these programs, I kept thinking when I'd meet legislators, I thought, you know, it'd be a lot easier if instead of trying to persuade somebody to vote with my view of the world, I could just vote. And, and that, would, that would be much more direct. I could lobby myself. And um, so I, that, that just triggered uh, the idea and eventually led to running for the state legislature and then running for the Senate. But during the, the two decades before I was back here, uh, back in D.C. as a U.S. Senator, uh, I didn't worry about nuclear destruction of the planet. I didn't wake up thinking I was living in target zone here in Washington, D.C. I, I kind of felt kind of carefree about that. I felt comfortable addressing other issues. And uh, things went okay for a while in... Uh, when I was back uh, here, uh, when I came back, 
uh, to the, uh, the Senate. I came back with the Obama election, was elected in 2008, came back in 2009, and you had the work on the New START Treaty. And uh, here I just want to stop and thank you all. Uh, Plowshares uh, supported a lot of work by a lot of organizations to do a lot of public education and persuasion. So everybody wave your hand if you were involved in helping with New START get passed. Thank you all. Thank you. That had followed on from the 2003 SORT treaty, and I must admit, out in Oregon, we didn't talk a lot about SORT. Um, it's almost a, it's kind of a gap in, in my uh, awareness of what was going on, but um, I watched how hard it was to get New START passed. Uh, it took a lot of work by all of you weighing in. It took a lot of work by John Kerry. It took, took a lot of work by Dick Luger. Uh, actually, Dick Luger's work on this was one thing he was attacked for in his uh, primary re-election campaign that, that he, he lost. Uh, and um, why did it have to be that way? It was an incredibly uh, reasonable step towards diminishing uh, the numbers of weapons and the stability of, of the forces. One thing I was very concerned about, though, in the course of, of that was the kind of the bargain struck to get it passed was to spend a huge amount of money doing all sorts of new strategic force renovation and so on and so forth. And that's something we should t still continue to think about. I plan to spend a trillion dollars over the next 30, 30 years on uh, uh, nuclear delivery systems and nuclear weapons. Well, so that was good, but then came the November 2016 election, just what feels like, well, it was a year ago, but it feels like a lifetime ago. And the bulletin moved the doomsday clock to uh, two and a half minutes. It's the lowest, I, I think it's the closest to midnight it's, it's ever been, closer than it was in 2004 when they were at three minutes. Now on the positive side, we'd had the implementation of the Iran nuclear deal, and that had moved fairly smoothly towards its first year goals. But offsetting that were tensions between the United States and Russia on Syria, on Ukraine, on election interference, on missile defense deployments. There was trouble going on between Pakistan and, and India, including some uh, verbal threats back and forth. Uh, North Korea conducted their fourth and fifth nuclear tests. And then there was that other factor. Any guesses on what that was? <laughs> the election of Donald Trump, a candidate who had made poorly considered comments about, the, the growing, about growing the U.S. nuclear arsenal, about suggesting Japan get a nuclear arsenal, suggesting South Korea get their own nuclear weapons, an individual who, during the campaign, had a tendency to ignore expert advice, including that of intelligence experts. Many folks I know, and myself included, thought we would see that individual, Donald Trump, evolve as he assumed the mantle of leadership, that he would take serious the immense responsibilities of office, including the immense responsibilities of being commander in chief, that he would start studying issues and absorbing lots of information from dedicated experts that he hadn't absorbed during the campaign, that he would work to strengthen our alliances. And maybe by January 2018, the doomsday clock would move back a few points, a few minutes. Maybe it'd go to five or six minutes. Anyone here want to make a bet on whether or not the doomsday clock goes to five or six minutes in January 2018? <laughs> I, I'd be on the side of the bet saying it does not. It does not. Um, we can hope, but um, there would have to be such a dramatic, unanticipated change of, of course. Um, I think we're going to see it go from two and a half minutes to something significantly less. Uh, we've seen a, a troubling tendency for a chief executive to attack our closest allies, to cozy up to some of the world's worst dictators, and in the world of nuclear stability, things are far, far worse. Uh, let's take a look at the situation in North Korea. The president threatened North Korea with fire and fury. Uh, he said our military options are locked and loaded. And these, these threats play directly into Kim Jong-un's hands because Kim Jong-un has always made the case that they needed nuclear weapons. North Korea needed nuclear weapons because of the threat from the United States of America, the desire of the United States of America to destroy them. And uh, 
Let's be clear, although the president seems to have concluded now that the only solution to North Korea is a military option, there is no military option. Um, I was able to travel with uh, Senator Markey and Senator Van Hollen earlier this year. Uh, I don't know if Markey relayed that trip. If he did, I'll skip over it. Did he talk about that trip? Yes, he did. He did. Well, quite, a, quite an amazing uh, chance to dialogue with Japan and South Korea uh, and uh, China. Uh, amazing opportunity to be on the border of the DMZ and to be at uh, Dandong and, and see the, the three bridges, the broken bridge, the new bridge, the single, the two-lane bridge. The, um, and to hear from defectors from North Korea and other experts along the way. But there is no military solution. There is a conventional deterrence from North Korea in the form of artillery that could wipe out hundreds of thousands of people in a short period of time in Seoul. Seoul, the greater population of Seoul, 25 a million individuals. The artillery, not easy to take out quickly. It's, in, in, it's hardened into to hillsides. Uh, and there is a nuclear threat from North Korea. We may not want to call them a nuclear power, but they have nuclear weapons. And a nuclear weapon can be delivered in ways other than, than a ballistic missile. We shouldn't assume that the only way to deliver a nuclear weapon is through a ballistic missile. So even now, without intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, they can extend a threat potentially throughout the world. We should maintain the long-term vision of a denuclearized Korean Peninsula. But in the immediate future, we have to work very carefully with China and the world to freeze North Korea's nuclear warhead tests, their long-range missile tests, and get North Korea into a dialogue for further progress. We have a variety of tools to apply, and we've applied some of them. We had the August UN resolution related to coal and lead and, and uh, seafood. And, um, we, when we were in Dandong, Dandong is a major place where North Korean seafood comes into China. And I can tell you that the local officials were beside themselves about how their economy was being impacted by giving up on the seafood trade. But they were doing it. It was enforced at that, at that moment. And enforcement is going to matter down the road. We had the September UN decision after the sixth uh, nuclear test. Uh, and that included an oil quota. Uh, that included a ban on textiles and natural gas. That included no new visas on international workers. I'm going to be very curious to see if that follows through because one of the things we heard on this list of ways to apply pressure, one certainly oil from China and Russia. And that China had used the, the oil valve in the past, but very, very worried about using it aggressively because they're afraid that North Korea will disintegrate. And if it disintegrates, that hundreds of thousands of refugees into China, and they might lose this buffer of having an anti-American peninsula, a portion of, of the peninsula. And so um, they have to really be persuaded that it can change conduct in North Korea without destroying North Korea. And that requires a very careful, coordinated, sustained, thoughtful, intensive negotiating strategy and dialogue. Well, I, I'm personally uh, not convinced that the administration has a team in place that's able to do that. Uh, there are other tools. The, uh, we heard from the defectors, student visas are incredibly valued by the elite of North Korea. They want their children to be able to get out of North Korea and, and get a foreign education. That's incredibly valued and that it would be very upsetting for the elite to uh, face a, a loss of their student visas. We heard from a young woman whose father had sacrificed everything. The two of them had escaped together. They'd been captured together in China, returned together, punished in different places, her father more severely than she was. And her father immediately, as soon as she was out, got her a message and said, no matter what they do to the rest of us, leave. And she had left. She had swum the river. She had gotten to the Korean uh, underground uh, and uh, underground railroad and, and made it to, uh, to, to South Korea, uh, knowing uh, that the impact on her family would be enormous. So another thing that these, these folks brought up is if China would work to help facilitate the flow of defectors from North Korea and get them to South Korea, not sell the women to be brides to farmers, not return them to North Korea for punishment, that too would be an enormous shakeup of North Koreans. We have to think about every tool available, but to use these tools, it has to 
be in partnership with many other nations, and that requires an intensive, intensive effort of diplomatic uh, strategy. Clarity of purpose, consistency, persistence. So um, that hasn't materialized, and uh, I don't think it will materialize. We saw that as Tillerson was trying to create a back dialogue, uh, that um, the president kneecapped him, uh, saying on October 1st, he tweeted, I told Rex Tillerson, our wonderful Secretary of State, that he is wasting his time trying to negotiate with the little rocket man. And the next tweet said, save your energy, Rex. We'll do what has to be done. Another threat uh, of military uh, action. A Secretary of State can only have, only have success in international conversations. He has full faith and, and support of the presidential team uh, behind him or her, and that is not the case. And so um, another thing that you need to be able to drive complicated international undertakings is the respect in American leadership. And we have not maintained that respect. Uh, the, um, the, the president's style, uh, his lack of knowledge in many areas, his uh, immature way of presenting issues has done deep damage to the respect that our leadership team carries around the world. And it didn't hurt, it didn't help any that uh, pulling out of Paris, technically we may not be pulling out uh, until uh, about, well, what is it, about October 2020, technically, but for the world, we're, we're, we're out. Uh, and uh, to do so on an, an effort that the United States had so closely worked with the world to make it happen that the world leaders would come together in numbers never for, before seen on this planet to make a deal to try to block or stop the biggest threat of climate disruption, climate chaos, this biggest threat to humankind that we have faced along with nuclear weapons, the other major threat. And um, then, uh, of course, um, he chose just days ago not to recertify the Iran nuclear deal. That, too, hurts our ability to work with other nations to be able to address North Korea. Because after all, why should they work with us on North Korea when they worked with us on Iran for a decade? Sanctions, more sanctions, let's strategize, do everything possible, let's negotiate, it's complex. But it happened. And Iran did all kinds of, of things in response, and then the U.S. undermines the, the accomplishment. That doesn't put the international team on your side. So not a lot is going right in regard to North Korea. And certainly this recent act uh, means that not a lot is going right in regard to freezing, turning back a nuclear program in, in Iran. I fully support Senator Markey's no first use legislation. I felt throughout my work on nuclear affairs going, going back to when I came out of graduate school, the U.S. should absolutely, every nuclear nation should absolutely pledge to no first use. And for us to have in place a process like his bill proposes that says the president does not have the authority to put his finger on a button in the nuclear football unless Congress has approved it would be enormously stabilizing and particularly stabilizing right now. And I hope we find a way to make this debate happen. And I hope that all of you, using your different organizations, could weigh in and help create some momentum behind that concept that no individual should have the power to simply start a nuclear war on their own. Well, um, the, meanwhile, the president's um, action on Iran has created significant risks that the Iran nuclear agreement will disintegrate. And this uh, challenge in which technically we haven't violated the agreement yet, the president operating under a legislative law in decertifying now throws it to Congress and it says basically Congress, reapply sanctions or consider reapplying sanctions. We must not do that. And I hope here again you will weigh in with your networks uh, to try to convey what an enormous mistake that would be. Iran agreed to eliminate its stockpile of medium-enriched uranium 
It uh, cut 98% of its low enriched. It reduces gas centrifuges. It's this metallized plutonium reactor. It will not build any heavy water facilities. And it has the most aggressive and furthest reaching inspections by the IAEA of any agreement ever done. And levels that, that I don't think Russia or the United States would ever have tolerated in our bilateral nuclear agreements. And things to remember out of this, it succeeded. The agreement succeeded in blocking a march towards the potential for nuclear weapons. Second, we didn't do it ourselves. We did it in cooperation with the world, and it took years of intensive efforts. And third, Iran is fully complying with the agreement. For us to reapply sanctions and to violate the agreement would be absolutely, totally unjustifiable and uh, destructive to international stability and another blow to our leadership in the world. I would ask for those who are so wanting to advocate uh, for disrupting this agreement, which, because they point out that there are many areas in which Iran is misbehaving. What is better, a bully with a conventional weapon or a bully with a nuclear weapon? And I think that's an easy thing to answer. Let's focus on the sanctions that Congress did pass for these other areas on ballistic missiles and on, on terrorism activity, uh, instruments that the President hasn't fully implemented. Let's not undo the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. So if that occurs, we will be standing on the edge of a cliff. And the President may be advocating that we do that because he says it can give us the opportunity to negotiate a better deal. Well, that is not going to, to happen. Uh, any sort of effort would involve a lot of countries and our allies say that that is not going to happen. Uh, they are not going to go back to the negotiating table. They are not going to reapply sanctions. And um, they have made it very clear. And I've sat down with the uh, ambassadors from the United Kingdom and France and Germany they are all urging us to stay in agreement, and they are all making it clear that they're not going to join us. I have now eaten up all my time when I thought it was only a five-minute presentation. <laughs> How did that happen? Somebody moved the clocks on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other clock. Let's work together so that we can move the hand on the doomsday clock back away from midnight and work to completely restore nuclear stability in the world. Thank you very much.